Hello everyone, I'm back with another edition of lectures. In this video, we'll be covering chapter 11, Long Run Economic Growth, Sources and Policies. So in this chapter, we'll briefly discuss economic growth historically over time around the world, identifying what determines how fast economies grow. We'll talk about economic growth specifically in the US and answered the question, why isn't the whole world rich, as well as discuss further growth policies. In the previous chapter, we looked at some ways to measure economic growth in long and short terms. In this chapter, we're specifically focusing on long-term economic growth and the effects of different government policies. Economic growth is not inevitable. History has shown us long periods of stagnation. And we've also seen some countries achieve rapid increases in GDP per capita, while other countries have not been able to keep pace. We're trying to develop a model of economic growth in this chapter to help us kind of answer why some countries have grown faster than other countries. So let's first talk about economic growth around the world. Economist Bradford DeLong, he estimated that in a thousand, excuse me, in 1 million BCE, that our ancestors had a GDP per capita of approximately $150. And in CE 1300, again, the world GDP per capita was still around $150. So there was no sustained economic growth before the Middle Ages. Essentially, we saw a stagnant growth over that period of time. So... What triggered the significant economic growth that occurred in England around 1750? That was the Industrial Revolution, which was the application of mechanical power to the production of goods. It subsequently spread throughout the world, resulted in sustained increases in real GDP per capita. The use of mechanical power allowed England and other countries like the US, France, Germany to experience long run economic growth. So the next thing we'll talk about is differences in incomes across countries. Small differences in economic growth rates result in big long-term differences in living standards. High-income industrial countries such as Western Europe, Australia, Canada, Japan, and New Zealand, and the U.S. contrast developing countries of the rest of the world. We've also seen a category emerge in the 1980s and 1990s called the newly industrializing countries. Those include Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan. They have progressed out of the developing category and are now beginning to emerge and break their way into the high income or industrial countries. Real GDP per capita is remarkably different across the world, even after correcting for differences in cost of living. In 2016, although this data is a little bit dated, there was a high of almost $140,000 in Liechtenstein to a low of $700 in the Central African Republic. I will send you a link to an interesting interactive website where you can kind of see how countries over time have increase, seen increases in the real GDP per capita. Okay, so let's move on to our next section, what determines how fast economies grow. We use an economic growth model to explain growth rates in real GDP per capita over 
time in the long run. We saw in the last chapter, the key to economic growth is labor productivity, the quantity of goods and services that can be produced by one worker or by one hour of work. And we had two main factors that affect labor productivity here, quantity of capital per hour worked and the level of technology. We'll be concentrating on changes in capital quantities and technological change. So we have three main sources of technological change, better machinery and equipment, increases in human capital, better means of organizing and managing production. Historically, we've seen inventions such as the steam engine, machine tools, assembly line, electric generators, computers, all of these things allow for faster economic growth. So we had steam engine, computers, machines, etc. They allow for faster economic growth. Human capital, we've already defined human capital as the accumulated knowledge and skills workers acquire from education and training or from their life experiences. Increases in human capital could be certifications, degrees, continuing education, etc. If you go and listen to a conference, things like that are increases in human capital. Finally, we have better means of organizing and managing production. If managers can do a better job of organizing production, labor productivity can increase. Examples of this include the just-in-time system involving assembling goods from parts as they arrive at the faculty exactly when they are needed. Excuse me. This involves assembling goods from parts as they arrived at the factory exactly when they are needed. And we can talk about supply chain management, that idea of being able to effectively deliver a product when it's needed is a source of technological change. So Let's suppose we want to now graph out our per worker production function. That's the relationship between real GDP per hour worked and capital per hour worked, holding the level of technology constant. So here we see our graph that shows our production functions. We can see that we have an increasing function. So the first units of capital are going to be the most effective. They allow output to increase the most, while increasing subsequently would result in diminishing returns here, smaller incremental increases in output. You see as the production function moves upward that our slope begins to flatten out. That's why we have diminishing returns. So if a country is lacking in capital, such as the developing countries we mentioned earlier, increases in capital are very effective at increasing real GDP per capita. Unfortunately, for countries that are already developed, if they have a lot of capital already, the US, for example, technolog technological change is more effective as a way to increase output per hour. So we can make a note up here that for high income countries, technological change is what increases output per hour more effectively while developing countries increases in capital. Is more effective. Again, we see diminishing returns when we improve capital per hour, but technological change does not have this limitation. Technological change causes the per worker function 
per worker production function to shift upward. So, in the long run, a country will experience an increasing standard in living only if it experiences continuing technological change. Increase in standard of living only if technological change is continuous. Continuous. Spelled that wrong. There we go. Okay. So I'm not going to get too much into the new growth theory or the new growth theory and capital and knowledge capital. But I do want to talk a little bit about protection protecting intellectual property. Governments seek to protect intellectual proper, property or IP through the use of patents and copyrights. I defined patents for you right there. Copyrights are related to creative works. Books, films, etc. Exclusive right to use the creation during and 70 years after the creator's lifetime. Another way to promote technological change is through, or technological innov innovation, is through subsidization is through subsidizing R&D and education. If we subsidize research and development and education, we see that occurring through direct government research, such as NASA, National Institutes of Health, and they can also provide tax incentives to companies who are performing R&D. Subsidizing education, in order to perform R&D, workers have to be trained, right? If companies provide the training to the workers, they're able to recoup the cost by essentially adjusting salaries accordingly. And the solution to this problem would be to subsidize education through grants and other training programs, such as reimbursement of tuition costs, things like that. As far as economic growth in the U.S., we can kind of see how the U.S. experience helps us to understand capital accumulation, technological change, driving economic growth. Here we can see the growth rate of real GDP per hour worked over the past several hundred years. So growth rates in the U.S. were relatively modest prior to 1900, then in the 20th century, Investment in R&D resulted in increasing growth rates, and these remained high until the mid-70s when they fell unexpectedly before picking up in the 1990s. So, what caused the slowdown in 1974 to 1995? Two ideas are that we had growth in services over goods, and there was a concentration on quality of life issues. Because there was a growth in services over goods, it became harder to measure. Service improvements. So Improvements in services mostly come through quality differences, which are significantly different, more difficult to measure than differences in good qualities. Alternatively, alternatively, I'm having a hard time speaking today. Alternatively, another argument is that the concentration on life issues, including 
health and safety. Environmental issues. And education. Because these things were being focused on, there was a shift away from measuring the actual goods and services included in economic growth because of the concentration on quality of life issues that, are, again, are more difficult to measure improvements in. Is the U.S. headed for a long period of slow growth? A lot of new technology drove labor improvements in the late 90s to present day. Faster data processing, better communication, internet, bandwidth, all of those things have been particularly important over the last decade and a half. So some economists think that GDP growth has actually understated actual growth in living standards. But it may be that some of these gains are actually going to improve consumer products rather than actually improving labor productivity, which makes the future as far as economic growth in the U.S. uncertain because... It's hard to identify exactly whether or not the changes in service quality have been impactful on labor productivity. Okay. So now let's address the question, why isn't the whole world rich? Economic growth model, again, it's just a model, predicts that poorer countries grow faster than richer countries. This is because additional capital is more effective in countries with smaller capital stocks, and there are greater advances in technology immediately available to the poorer countries. Catch-up is the idea and prediction that the level of GDP per capita in poor countries will grow faster than in rich countries. The lack of growth in many poor countries is due to several things. One, the failure to enforce the rule of law. Two, wars and revolutions. Three, poor public education and health. And four, low rates of saving and investment. So what is the rule of law? It's the ability of the government to enforce laws related to private property and contracts. So we can briefly draw a small graph kind of showing you what this economic growth model looks like. It is downward sloping. It's called, this is called the catch-up line. And we see growth in real GDP per capita. Let's just abbreviate that. here on the y-axis and we have initial level of GDP on the x-axis. So we can see that poor countries, because they had a lower initial level of GDP, would be up here. And so you see a higher growth, while richer countries with a higher initial level of GDP, they're going to have a slower growth. So that illustrates the catch-up predicted by the economic growth model. So again, we defined what rule of law is. It's important that a government guarantees property rights, all because entrepreneurs won't risk starting a business if they aren't confident their property rights are going to be enforced. Wars and revolutions make investment in technological growth def difficult. 
due to the destruction of infrastructure in place and other reasons. Poor public education and health. If you have weak public schools, poor health care, workers are less productive. They're not obtaining and growing human capital. Low rates of saving investment propagates insecurity within the financial system and prevents growth. So to exit the vicious cycle of low savings and investment is through foreign investment. We have foreign direct investment and foreign portfolio investment. You can read those definitions. And we can talk a little bit here about globalization, which is the process of countries becoming more open to foreign trade and investment. Right now, globalization is experiencing somewhat of a contraction as patriotism amongst different countries has caused countries to become more focused on internal growth and domestic growth at home. However, globalization does occur in cycles, so in the future there may be a resurgence of globalization. Okay, so finally, let's talk a little bit about growth policies. We have enhancing property rights and rule of law. We have improving health and education, policies that promote technological change, and policies that promote saving and investment. So essentially, policies that combat all of the issues where we see that cause lack of growth here. These are the types of policies that are essential to fostering economic growth. Enhancing property rights and the rule of law involves working towards independent courts and eliminating corruption. It's interesting to look at different metrics for corruption and kind of see which countries are considered more corrupt than other countries and how that relates to their GDP per capita. It's important that reform occurs in order to combat corruption to incentivize economic growth. Health and education. We can talk a little bit about brain drain here. If you improve health and education, you decrease the risk of brain drain. That's when highly successful and educated people leave their developing countries to go to high income countries and then don't return. So they essentially take human capital knowledge out of their home countries to developed high-income countries. Policies that promote technological change. Again, we've talked through this lecture about how technological change is essential for growth. It's often more important than acquiring capital. Remember that technological change, that's actually causing the production function to shift upward which is why it's so important and another way low-income countries can encourage technological change is through encouraging foreign direct investment so making themselves more attractive to foreign investment finally policies that promote saving and investment People need to know their assets won't be seized by corruption. Corruption is another important factor here. You need to eliminate that so people can be confident in the financial system. Governments can also encourage savings and investment through tax incentives, tax advantage savings plans, or investment tax credits. But there has to be confidence within the financial system before people will be willing to save and invest. A central assumption of this entire chapter is that economic growth is beneficial to citizens of the country. This is fairly clear for low-income countries, but some people maintain that further economic growth may not be desirable in high-income countries. Arguments against 
growth include negative impacts on the environment, depletion of natural resources, diminishment of distinctive cultures. Again, there's always going to be a trade-off in whatever decision is made, so it's important to keep that in mind as far as how these policies can actually have an impact later on in the future. All right, so that was, I know, a very brief, quick rundown of chapter 12. So if you have further questions, comments, or concerns about long-run economic growth, feel free to let me know.